The end. Slowly but surely. Uh, Inevitably, of course, I'm going to get a letter from a friendly type who's going to say, Dear Mr. Shepard, will you please speak up a little louder? We're not hearing you well in Staten Island. Now, look. The master plan is slowly being unfolded to me, and I figure within the next four or five weeks I might be right down to the veritable core of it. Now, I, I can't explain it to you any more than just to say that. The master plan... I mean, you know the master plan, that, that the Gordian knot of life, the strange convoluted puzzle of existence, eh? The twisting labyrinthian river of eternity. Well, it's beginning to make sense. It's beginning to slowly unfold. And, and uh, not more than 15 minutes ago, I had one of those, those, those startling moments of clarity and lucidity that come to men maybe four or five times in a lifetime. Now, this, this, this problem of the, the moment of lucidity is one that has been bugging people for many years. Have you ever had this sensation, uh, all kidding aside, this, this sensation of walking down the street? It might come any moment. It might come five minutes before you go to bed. You're brushing your teeth. You're mad. It might come just before you're getting ready to eat a salami sandwich or down an egg cream. And, uh, by the way, I was in a very swank restaurant the other day. One of the kind, you know, that has the the cordovan leather booths, sort of semi-circular cordovan leather booths, and it has these these waiters who move back and forth with black suits and black looks, carry great big maroon-colored menus with them, and sort of lurk in the darkness, and there's quiet music being played somewhere. People And the guy in the next booth says, I'll have an egg cream, please. (laughs) <laughs> oh, gee. You know, in, in spite, I'll have an egg cream. I'll have an... That's like my mother came all the way out. I'll never forget the time I took her to this fancy restaurant. She came all the way out from the Midwest. Do you know what it's like in the Midwest, any of you? Have any of you ever sat down to a, to a meal in the Midwest, in a Midwestern restaurant? Well, here I figured that she had come out of the desert. I was in the east, the fate east. The, the, the east of golden promise. What was it that Thomas Wolfe used to call Manhattan? The enfabled rock. And I was here. I mean, we're all here. You realize how how, how fortunate we are. We are the fortunate few. I mean, out of the billions of people who live all over the world, you realize how lucky we are. We're here. You're you. (laughs) You just think who you could have been. Oh. Boy, you break out in a cold sweat when you realize how lucky you are to be so, you know, so real and right. Oh, you know, I mean, oh, come on, let's cut out all the fooling around. Let's admit it. Let's cut the kidding out, huh? Let's cut out all this jazz, all this editorializing, and let's admit it. Here we are, we're us, and by George, we're sure. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and anyway, my mother, living out there in the great inverted bowl of the Midwest, was still in the center of the, the veritable storm eye of the, of the desert itself, right out there in the Midwest. I, I guess you don't know what it's like. But sometimes out in the Midwest, night goes on for over four months. And all you can hear is the sound of the natives chewing. And once in a while, lowing to one another as they bump on the street corners. And then they move apart and search, search. It's the eternal quest, of course. Oh, by the way, how are you doing in your quest? I mean, you know, the search. Well, uh, this this day came to pass when there had been an exchange of letters and it had been decided that my mother was going to come out and visit me in the enfabled east. And there were all the preparations were made. A stock of wedgies was laid in. A stock of sequent tinseled lady gowns were, were purchased and were altered to fit the particular type of tinseled lady that my mother is. All things were done so that, the, so that it would be right and real. And finally she arrived. And the first day I took her to this, this restaurant. As a matter of fact, it happened to be an Indian restaurant. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I'm thinking, what, what is it that she, she, she will like more than anything else? The, more, the, the, the least like the Midwest. I took her to this Indian restaurant. Now, I don't particularly dig Indian food. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's Indian food. There's something about Americans, by the way, that make them just insatiably curious about other people's food. Insatiably curious and vaguely 
they feel vaguely inferior to it. You know, there's hardly any place you can go in Europe where they have uh, little American restaurants. Just a little American restaurant where you get a bad hamburger, a genuinely bad hamburger. I mean, bad in the American way. Uh, just no, you don't find them there. There are a few places in Rome. As a matter of fact, you know, there's a rash of places opening up here and there, like, say, for example, in Brussels and Paris and in Rome, called the Californian. But they, they're not at all like, they're not the Californians like here. They just call them the Californian. Somehow California seems to be definitely American to the Europeans. There's no place called the Indianan or the Hoosier, just the Californian. And you go in there, and it's it's strange. It's uh, it's not American, and it's not Italian. It's just blah. It's not Californian, certainly. And so there is this thing in Americans who, when they feel like they really want to go out and do it, you see, really want to lay it on thick, they go to a foreign restaurant. I don't know what there is to this why. Uh, you always feel when you're eating this stuff that you should like it because you're in such exotic surroundings and it's a very special occasion. And so you eat it. And I, I remember this moment with my mother. And so we get to this Indian restaurant and they had a big menu all full of curries and one thing and another. I'm sitting there. I'm the, I'm the New Yorker now, you know. I would just like to know, just, just for purposes of uh, my own particular statistics, how many people are living in New York, how many Manhattanites are people who have, let's say there are, they are immigrants from uh, Iowa or from uh, Ohio or from Utah, millions and millions, you have no idea what a, what a terrible lure this place is to people who live outside of this place. And, of course, once you're here, you're here, you know, and just like all of mankind, you feel vaguely dissatisfied with it. You just have to. No matter where you are, you're, you're going to be you're going to be unhappy. It's, it, it goes all the way back to original sin, so please don't ask me to discuss that this morning. <laughs> Why we are unhappy. What is bugging? Uh, that, that, gets, that goes into the next semester, and I don't think the class is ready yet. And so... <laughs> So here comes my mother, loaded with original sin, out of the Middle West, you see. And I'm sitting here in the enfabled, in the enfabled East, in the golden rock of Manhattan, loaded with original sin, both of us, you see. My mother has seniority, however, in the original sin department. I'm just a neophyte working on it. So <laughs> we go to this jazzy restaurant, and of course it's one of these places with $9 cover charge and the whole bit. And the Punjabi-type uh, waiter comes up with a turban and all of you know, it's going on. For, he has a long crease. You know, what is it, this long, wiggly knife that they carry in their belt? And the whole business, you know, it's all, oh, he, he, Mem Sahib, Mem Sahib. He's bowing from the waist back and forth. And you feel like any minute now the asp is going to show up and Daddy Warbucks and someone's going to get beheaded before this is over. And so we're going through this whole business and he finally brings us a 47-dish curry. You know, what is it, this type of curry, you know, where everything, you, little dishes of condiment all over, and you sprinkle egg yolks, and you sprinkle egg whites, and, and toasted almonds, and you sprinkle toasted coconut on things, and the, the steamed chicken, oh, we're really swinging there, and all this stuff is piled up. And my mother is, is keeping her own counsel. She is not saying anything. She is wearing her tourist wedgies, and she is not opening her trap. And, of course, I'm saying, oh, isn't this great, Ma? Hmm, boy. <coughs> Uh, yes, please. More water. Isn't this great? My, hey, how about some water here? Have you ever had 17-dish curry? You need nothing but water. You sluice it down. Hey, Ma, isn't this great? <clears throat> water, please, waiter. And you're eating away there, and the lights are dim, and you can hear Indian music being played from a loudspeaker. And suddenly she says for the first time what was really on her mind. I knew something was bugging her. She says, I don't like to put on the dog. I don't like to put on the dog. I said, well, Ma, what do you mean, putting on the dog? You're here. It's New York. This is, you know, this is Manhattan, and I'm, I'm taking you out for a good time. Now, we're not putting on the dog. Silence. She continues to shovel away at the rice. I said, well, Ma, I mean, aren't you having a good time? She says, yeah. Yes, very good time. Very, very good time. And it's that, it's that kind of statement, it's the kind of look in the eye that says, yes, I am having a good time. 
and slowly the walls are beginning to sink down into the into the into the thick carpets and the Punjabi the, the Punjabi waiter looks exactly like the guy I've been buying my egg creams from in this little chromium plated joint at 7th and, and Broadway ever since I came to New York you know the same guy who, who sells me who <laughs> and so so it just, it's not working and I said well Ma look look Ma look why don't you relax and there's a long pause and she says why don't you I said, but I, mean, I am relaxed. I'm relaxed. Look, all those people. See, look, this is New York. This is the way people in New York live. And all the while, people from New York were coming in and out of this restaurant. And she says, they're all putting on the dog. All of them putting on the dog. And I don't like to put on the dog. And ten minutes later, we're out in the cold, sweet air of 7th Avenue, bitingly. That air is sweeping over us. And I had nothing more to say. I began to slowly understand that all of mankind is in one way or another putting on the dog. Do any of you happen to know the meanings, the origins of that expression? Are there any people out there who are dog putter honors? And so I'm beginning to see, you know, as it begins to unfold, that there is a meaning to this master plan. I'm not going to be the one to put on the dog. There is a little meaning in it. And, and I'm getting into a cab not more than 25 minutes ago in a moment of lucidity. I'm getting, I mean, real lucidity. You know that kind of lucidity that you have that lasts for about 15 seconds? Just suddenly everything is clear and brilliant. The ideas are like crystal. They're carved out of, out of beautiful stone. And they're, they're, they're apparent. And then a minute later, you've forgotten what they were. And so I'm getting in the cab, and then I begin to realize that there is a master plan that I am being contacted by the infinite. I get into a cab, a little Studebaker, 1959 Studebaker Lark that was all battered, pushed in, bumpy, and kind of dirty, but nevertheless doubtfully struggling through life. A little yellow cab. I get in, and just as I get in, I see the name on the door of this cab company in red block letters inscribed on the yellow background. I had gotten into an aggressive cab. Believe it or not, I rode here to the station in a cab marked The Aggressive Cab Company. And as we approached the studio, it was beginning to soak in more and more and more the aggressiveness of this cab that I was in and the aggressiveness of the entire life that most of us are trying to lead. And I began to understand, too, that there are two types of people. There are, there, there are the aggressive and the defensive. There are those who are always slowly running backwards. Always, they, they appear to be walking towards you. Have you ever known a guy who seems to be walking towards you, and as he walks towards you, you get the distinct impression that he's running backward as fast as he can? There, there, are, there are the aggressive and there are the defensive. There are those who are up on barricades, waiting, waiting to see the whites of the... Oh, here comes another one, the whites of the... Don't fire, don't fire yet. Give him a chance. See whether he's a friend or foe. Are you smoking more now, oh. but enjoying it less? Oh, there then it is. you should change to camels. Have a camel cigarette. Yes, have a real cigarette. Have a camel. Today, Camel is the best-tasting cigarette of all. That's why you get complete satisfaction each and every time you light up. The best tobacco makes the... No, there, there's just... Uh... There's just nothing I can do about it. I can't, I can't help it. I can't go away from it. I cannot retreat from it. Uh, I, I just cannot escape from it. I've tried to, I've tried to, I've tried to. And I can't do it. Uh, what I'm trying to say here, I guess, is, in a sense, put in another way what one of the writers of letters to me uh, put in his letter a few days ago. He says, you know, Shepard, he said, uh, I can't help but feel 
that you look at life exactly the way I do, and that is you look at it as one big circus. Now, there's nothing wrong in that. Uh, for some reason or other, I have noticed that people who cannot look at life that way vaguely suspect that there is something very deeply wrong with people who do. And they also feel that there is something not quite trustworthy about them. And they're probably right. <laughs> they are probably right. I, I can't explain it any more than to say that. That uh, there are a few people I have known. I, I know that, that this is one of my problems. That I have tried to become serious about things. Now when I say serious, I say it in big capital letters. I have tried to become deeply serious about certain things that I have started out to do. And it has never really worked. I, I can't explain this, and I, I've tried to explain it to myself. I've tried to go down underneath the surface to find out why this is, what kind of defense mechanism this might be. <laughs> you know, I, I know all the psychological cliches about it. But still, and at the same time, it, it is an interesting phenomenon. And occasionally you will see a guy who has this look in the eye of the one who, no matter what happens, can't help but see life as though he's sitting in some kind of a box seat. And he's looking out, and it's not a three-ring circus, it's about a ten-million-ring circus. And there are aerialists, there are guys being shot out of cannons, there are guys wearing clown suits, walking around with little, with little dogs, there are chicks uh, hanging by their teeth from long, swinging silver chains from up near the top of the up near the top of the tent. There are guys selling popcorn. There are freaks. I mean, the whole business and the whole, the whole shooting match, as my mother would say, is a gigantic circus, and we all have a ticket to it. And we are all at one and the same time both audience and participants. Because a circus is nothing, believe me, without, without an audience. A show is nothing without an audience, and this is not an old... Uh, actor or actress cliche you know uh, there's always there's always some one of the one of the things that makes me just turn inside out and and turn up around the edges like old lettuce is when i hear some actor or actress being interviewed by one of the friendly kindly obsequious interviewers on which uh, certainly radio abounds and the interviewer is always saying well uh, miss miss stanley uh, we all know that you're a, a magnificent woman and a, and a magnificent actress and a fantastic artist and a much finer human being than any of the rest of us. Uh, Miss Stanley, uh, <clears throat> I'm so excited, Miss Stanley. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Stanley, uh, could you tell us how it feels to be such a fantastic, magnificent, magnanimous, uh, fully rounded, endowed actress? I mean, how does it feel like? And then there's a pause and she says, uh, well... Uh, I, I, first of all, I'd like to say that, that, uh, I, I do everything that I do for the wonderful audience. I, 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 I can say this, that my life would be nothing without all those wonderful little people. The little people who come in from the Bronx and from Queens and from the Middle West, who come and make up that wonderful audience that every night I give my all for. I, I can say that my life would be nothing without the little people. And I want to thank, now that I've been given the opportunity, I would like to thank each and every one of you little people, all the little people out there to whom, well, I've dedicated my life. You have given us in the theater so much, all of you little people. Well... Let me say this. If somehow you could blot out, if somehow magically you could imagine a circus, can you imagine walking into a dark, cavernous tent, a huge tent, a black tent, a black tent made of strange black material, flying black flags, and there's black sawdust leading to the tent. You walk in a black night this tent, and you notice that there are lights, beautiful colored lights, red, green, yellow, orange lights, and you hear the sound of a calliope playing. This is the calliope, you see. You hear the sound, you hear the sound of great activity going on in this black tent. 
And as you walk along this black, black, long, twisting, black sawdust trail, you finally come to where the man is taking tickets. He looks at you with unseeing eyes. He just stands up there. Ah, I'm ready to go, ready to go. Five minutes, a big show is about to begin. Our five minutes about to begin. Let's go. Come one, come all. And you're the only one. You're the only one. And you walk past him. He doesn't even bother to sell you a ticket, nor does he bother to take a ticket. You just know that you don't have to pay, and you walk on through. And you slowly part those canvas doors, and inside is a circus. A circus, and it's in full swing. There's a beautiful girl wearing a pearl-colored bathing suit. She's swinging by her teeth from a silver trapeze. And there's a man standing up there way high atop a tightrope. And he's walking across very, very carefully, carrying a long silver balancing pole. And on each end is a small kinkajou bear, followed by a New York Times reporter. Each one, and they're all going across. And the, the, the clowns are dancing, and they're leading little dogs. People are being shot out of guns. Boom! And there's no audience. There is no audience. And somehow you know that you're not even an audience, that you are invisible and do not exist. Impossible. Impossible. It's, it can't be, you see. <laughs> it, it's a frightening thought, isn't it? It is a frightening thought that there, that there is a show without an audience. And so you see the ludicrousness of this. It is impossible to create the same. It's, it's just like creating an ocean without water. You cannot do it. Can you imagine an ocean or a desert without sand? It just doesn't exist. It does not. A hot day without heat. No. There is no show without those who, who come to see. And that's the way with this fantastic circus of life. Are, are you... Are you, as a performer in the circus of life, are you a tightrope walker? <laughs> yes, yes. It's getting pretty close to home, eh, Fred? <laughs> yes. Step by step, you put your foot forward. Ah, yes, another one. And down below, the band is going... <laughs> you know, a long drum roll... <laughs> And, and the, the announcer has said, And now, Charlie Murchison, daredevil beyond all daredevils, will attempt the death-defying feat that he alone has been able to accomplish. He is going to live the life of Charlie Murchison, a dangerous feat beyond the comprehension of all mankind. Will you please be quiet in the audience? Mr. Murchison's life is one of the most dangerous lives that have ever been lived on the face of this fantastic globe. And now, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, in the center ring, Charlie the Magnificent Murchison. Please be quiet and do not move while this dangerous act is being drawn to a conclusion. The drums start rolling, and you, Charlie Murchison, slowly begin to move one foot before the other on the vast tightrope of life. One foot before the other, and you're carrying your back. Is this the type of performer you are? Eh? Or, on the other hand, are you this type of performer? Are you this type of performer? And now, ladies and gentlemen... In the center ring, ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Murchison, the world-renowned clown who has entertained all the crowd heads of Europe, all the outstanding moguls of Madison Avenue, Charlie Murchison, clown extraordinary. And then you begin to go through your act, carrying a beach ball on your nose. Bouncing up and down, hoping that they'll just laugh a little bit. Just a little bit. And thereby get you off the hook again. And all your clothes are raggle-taggle. And your, your great painted face, a big tear has been painted near your left eye. And there you go, Charlie Murchison, clown extraordinary. Out there working with the Indian clubs again. Oh, dream... 
Ah, uh, eternal. Oh, oh, what? Or, or are you this kind of a performer? Stop it, Jim. Stop. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, 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 ho. Ow, ow, ow. Raus mit uns. Ow. Oh, yes. Hold it. Maybe you're this sort of performer. There is suddenly heard throughout the big top of life the shrill, shocking note of a whistle. Attention, please! Oh, attention, please, ladies and gentlemen! Daredevil, Cannonball McAleer, James McAleer, Citizen Ordinary, will now attempt the death-defying, fantastic feat of being shot out of the mouth of an 88-millimeter cannon unaided by nets and unaccompanied by any artificial means whatsoever. Ladies and gentlemen, this particular feat has never before been attempted by any mortal human being in the gigantic circus of life. We respectfully command total silence while this death-defying feat is carried to, we hope, a successful conclusion. And then slowly the drums begin to roll. This time in a funeral dirge. And there you come out dressed in a black suit of tights, wearing a black football helmet and a black look. You stand there before the crowd and you bow graciously as Boris Karloff would bow. To the left, to the right, and to those in the center. With infinite dignity and with infinite sorrow, you are about to give your all. And then several men dressed as a firing squad, dressed in... Ceremonial fatigues, wearing ceremonial beards, lead you to a platform that leads to the breach of your gigantic cannon from which you will be shot. With a last wave, joie de vivre, you are inserted into the breach. And the drums begin to roll faster and faster. Brump, brump. Maybe this is the type of performer you are, eh? Uh In the vast circus of life. (laughs) I have known several. One-shot men. (laughs) And then, 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 how about this time? Maybe you are this type. This is the type who scurries through life, scuttles, scurries through life, hardly seen by the others. His voice is the only thing that is heard, and occasionally, when something is needed, he is there to provide that small service. You know, many people retreat from life by being always of service. That's all they are. They, they, they just want to be of service. Just just let me let me help. Let me help. That's all. Just uh, don't hurt me, but let me help here. Let me there, there, easy boy. Let me tie your shoes for you now. There, there, let me smooth your uh, this is this is another type. Scurrying through life. And you, you see them, you see in this vast circus of life. Actually, you don't see them because they kind of get in the way of the main view. But but when you need them, they are very handy. They are wearing white hats, and they're wearing white coats, and they have big bags slung around their shoulders, or maybe a big box. And sometimes the bag contains popcorn. Other times the box contains fresh hot dogs. Or maybe, maybe a small refrigerator full of beer. And this type is going around, ice cold, ice cold beer here, ice cold beer, yeah, ice cold beer, ice cold, we got an ice cold, ice cold. How many? Uh, two? Uh, hey, would you please pass this uh, down to the, down the aisle? Uh, come on. Uh, well, ice cold beer, ice cold beer, ice cold beer. Always opening beer bottles, always passing ice cold beer to others, always trying to make change on the run, and always trying to keep out of the line of vision. Ice cold beer? Oh, excuse me, ma'am. I, I, I say, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I, excuse me. 
Get out of the way, will you, for crying out loud. Get out of my way. I'm trying to see. Can't you see? Eyes call, bear. Eyes call. Are you this type of performer? Hmm? Hey. And then, then, then there's another type, of course. There's a, knife, a very definite type of performer in this vast circus of life who is not even inside the tent, you see. He's not even inside of the thing. He's standing out in front. He's wearing a checkered vest. He's wearing a derby hat. And he is shouting, Five minutes of big shows about to begin. Five minutes of big shows about to begin. Hey, everyone, come on, come all the big shows about to begin. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Let's go and five minutes of big shows about to begin. Hey, hey, hey. Maybe you're this type of performer. This town abounds in them. It abounds in them. Did I tell you about the guy I met a couple of weeks ago who had the Castro account? Did I tell you about the guy I met about three or four months ago who worked in an agency? Get this one and put this right on the top of your head and think about it for a moment. I will not even mention the agency, nor will I even mention the people involved. But he worked in an agency that handled the Hungarian Freedom Account believe it or not. And he told me that the day that the Hungarian Freedom Revolt came up, the reason that all the confusion resulted and ensued was that the account man on the Hungarian Freedom Account was out of town on a three-day trip to the coast, and they couldn't contact him, and they didn't know what to say to the Hungarian Freedom Fighters as they were being shot between the eyes. And I said, "What, what are you talking about? Well, we had the Hungarian account, the Hungarian Freedom Account. I said, you mean the Hungarian Freedom Account was handled by an agency and it had and it had an account executive who handled it? So, of course. Can't you just see the president of the country getting on the phone, calling up his agency and says, now it hit the fan. It has hit the fan. Will you please get a hold of Murchison? The Hungarian Freedom Account Executive, hurry up for crying out loud. Either that, or the agency man is red hot calling the president, and he is saying, look, now look, our business is public relations. How, how, mu- how much, how much trouble do you think we can get you out of? And so maybe you're one of those performers who is not even somehow involved in life and somehow thinks that life is one vast mercantile situation. One vast market upon which you can only capitalize if your voice is loud enough. Hurry, 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 hurry. <laughs> Maybe you're this type of performer. More and more. And then then maybe you're this sort. This is another sort entirely. There's another kind. There's another type. And this type usually, usually actually, is, uh, well, let's put it this way. Let's see this type of performer as she enters the ring. The big the big announcer, the tall, thin man wearing the black cutaway coat and the white the white high water pants, carrying the whip, wearing the long silk hat, steps to the microphone and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, now the world famous bareback rider, Madame Lazaza, the most beautiful world famous bareback rider in all of Circusdom, is now set to entertain us in the center ring. And then, the band goes, and out comes this big, beautiful, white Percheron horse with large, brown, liquid eyes. And there is this chick. There is this chick standing on one itsy-bitsy toe, wearing this itsy-bitsy little itsy-bitsy white sequin thing, waving at all the crowd. Hello there, hello. Hello, everybody, I'm cute. Oh, hello there, oh, my school, I'm so cute. Oh, you're so wonderful. And the giant Percheron, who is usually a male of one kind or another, quietly galumps around the middle of the room. His big brown liquid eyes. Hello there. Oh, I'm so cute. Hello there. And the band is going. A pretty girl is like a melody. La da 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 da. Hello there. And then finally, off the off the ring and out out into the night goes Miss Beautiful. 
<laughs> now, you know this performer. Of course you do. Of course you do. Of course. And then there's another type of performer in the vast circus of life. And this is a thin, angry type wearing black horn rim glasses who sits in the darkness under the stands and counts the receipts and sits there with a comptometer machine at her side. And all the while, the band is playing. She hears it. She's part of it. But she never sees it at all. Boing. 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 Ah, oh, vast circus of humanity. Oh, vast center ring of life. La, la, pu, pu, pi, la, tu, 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 ba, 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 ba. Ah, oh, la, ti, 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 la, pa, pa, pu. Ba 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 bi ba bu bu bu. Oh, I always chasing rainbows. Oh. What do you mean I'm always chasing rainbows? I know what I'm after. Huh. Oh yes. Oh, there are other performers, of course, and some of the saddest ones of all. The last. The last clown has disappeared. The last bareback rider has gone into the shadows of the tinsel tent, the tinsel work and sleep tent. And then on the scene come these people in the rumpled clothes. On the scene come these these guys who are vaguely shaggy and these women who are very lumpy, carrying pails and mops. And you see them moving around in the darkness. Sweeping up, and you know what they're sweeping up. Sweeping up, hosing it down, working away out there in the darkness, just working their lives away, sweeping up the mess that everybody else has left behind, sweeping, grumbling, and and I would I would venture to say that this is probably the greatest percentage of all. This is the greatest number of all the performers, the sweepers up. Who never, they're never even awake when the show is going on. They don't come to work till three o'clock in the morning. Philosophically speaking, the show has long since passed. When they pack their simple lunches, their sad, simple peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and apples, and their five-cent pies, their pints of of half-cold instant coffee. And they pack it all into their lunchbox, and they go off to sweep up, to sweep up, just to sweep up. And these people begin very early in life, you know. In fact, every one of the performers begin early in life. The little one standing on her toes on top of that perch around, <laughs> was doing that at the age of two and being encouraged. Isn't she cute? And all the while, she's galloping around the center ring in the living room. For whatever frustration she wants to work out, <laughs> and all the while, the little kid who is two years old is already beginning to retreat to the spot directly behind the potted palm, where he is preparing to sell his popcorn. <laughs> I hope somebody needs a popcorn there, or maybe a sandwich. I'll go get it for them, and they won't—they won't be mad at me then. I'll—I'll—I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get some—I'll get some candy for them. I'll—I'll I'll make things happier. And all the while, some little kid is preparing to be shot from a gun. As he does his only little thing that he can do, and that is stand on one foot on the window ledge, three stories above the street. Hey, get him off! What are you? What's the matter with you? For crying out loud, Donald! How many times have we told you to stay off that window ledge? Donald is just preparing to stand on the window ledge all of his life. Donald is prepared to be a one-shot man, but boy, what a shot! That's all Donald is preparing for. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, as you slowly grow into your role, the, 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 the externals begin to be fused one into the other until you can hardly tell the girl standing on the bareback horse from the girl down below there 
who, who tries to look like the girl standing on the bareback horse, but who nevertheless is chained eternally to her mental comptometer machine and is eternally counting the eternal tickets, no matter how she dresses. And then, of course, there are three or four or five who inevitably must come out in their raggle-taggle clothes, bouncing a beach ball on their nose even at the age of two. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, head, 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 The big circus of our life is about to begin. The big circus of life is about to begin. The biggest circus in the history of all the world, the world, the world. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. For just one dollar, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar, you'll see the biggest circus, the biggest prize circus, the biggest wonderful, wonderful surprise circus of all, of all, of all, of all, and you're part of it, sir. Come on, come on, come on, one. Um, how many did you say? Um, one, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We'll be back in just 15 minutes. This is WOR Radio, your station for news. What do you hear in the best of circles? Shave for all around. People all have found. The pleasure doesn't fade. After one or two, you, you get that first peer pleasure each beer through. Now that's why you hear in the best of circles. Shave for all around. Schaefer invites you to watch the parade of American history at Freedom Land USA. Along with the recreations of great events of our past, Schaefer has been invited to show you as it's brewing in 1842 and as it is today. Come out and see that original Schaefer Brewery, the home site of America's oldest lager beer. And while you're there, pick up an entry blank for the Schaefer My Best Gal contest. It's exciting, easy to enter, and valuable prizes can be yours. This is WOR AM and FM New York, owned and operated by RKO General. See the four-star motion picture Song Without End, together with the magnificent stage show, now at Radio City Music Hall, Song Without End. At the WOR time signal, 1 o'clock. James McCarthy reporting. For up to the minute reports, stay tuned to this station. Now the news. A ragtag army made up mostly of volunteers from all walks of life began laying siege on the Congo's Kasai province in a move to liberate the valuable mining state from the central Congo government forces and install Albert Kalonji as its provisional head just a short while ago. Kalonji is the self-styled president of the mineral-rich Kasai area who was forced to flee his government seat by forces of Congolese Premier Patrice Lumumba some time ago. At the time, Lumumba's forces invaded Kasai and took control over much of the area. Kalonji charged that the Congo Premier's troops were being led by Czechoslovakian military advisors and were using communist arms and munitions. This was later confirmed by a communist leader in Leopoldville, who told reporters that the Reds were more involved than most people thought, adding, you don't think they, the Congolese, could do this by themselves, do you? The volunteer force of Kalanji, estimated at anywhere from 250 to 500 men, crossed the river Lebilash from another breakaway state, Katanga, and are headed for Laputa in central Kasai. Katanga's premier, Moshi Chambe, is said to have armed the Kalanji rebels and offered military advisors in the battle, but this has not been confirmed. More news in a moment. Say, baseball fans, do you have an inquisitive youngster who has the knack of asking just the baseball question that stumps you? Or do you yourself sometimes wonder about a baseball question or two? If so, here's big news about an exciting new book. It's the Mutual Baseball Annual, and it's baseball's biggest $1 value. Edited by Van Patrick, the Mutual Baseball Annual is like 16 Major League yearbooks rolled into one, over 200 action photos plus biographical sketches and pictures of almost 200 stars. You get a sweeping view of the 1960 baseball season, as well as the home schedules and rosters of all teams. And an extra bonus, an all-time record section. So if you want the answers to baseball questions, get the Mutual Baseball Annual. Just send $1 to Baseball, Mutual Network, New York 18. A $2 value for only a dollar. Order your copy today. That's $1.00. To Baseball, Mutual Network, New York, 18. Well, America, it appears as though Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev will be alone in his publicity-seeking appearance at the U.N. General Assembly this month, as diplomatic observers claim the West's leaders have adopted a stay-away policy. 
The observer said the first round of consultations between President Eisenhower, French President de Gaulle, and Britain's Prime Minister Macmillan favored this policy, but they have left the door open for possible new developments and won't commit themselves to the meeting until sometime next week. The highway death toll is reaching staggering proportions today as Americans try to race the Grim Reaper on the nation's roads. Paul Jones, Information Director for the National Safety Council, gives us the details. 61 lives already have been lost on the highway in accidents since the Labor Day weekend holiday began last evening. While this is running slightly behind the Labor Day toll last year, it is catching up at such a rapid pace that every motorist should double his care and try to prevent every possible accident. The 30 hours, the first 30 hours of the holiday period have been proved to be the most dangerous. Drive accordingly, please. The first Russian freighter to take grain and cotton from the Black Sea to Cuba has left Odessa for Havana, where it will exchange its cargo for Castro sugar. Six red oil tankers are also in this convoy, two empty Again, for Castro Sugar. I can't help but see, I'm walking along. Uh, I'm, I'm just paying attention only to my own world. I'm walking along on 16th Street the other day and just reading signs. Uh, there are those of us who read signs, and then there are those who apparently never see this world around us. One of the most significant signs here in New York is a sign that flashes M-O-N-Y. Off and on, M-O-N-Y. Do you know that I was in New York for over three months before I realized that that wasn't a misspelling? <laughs> it's true. I, I, I had no idea what this meant. And I just thought, well, it's New York, you know. And I, I, I used to walk up and down Broadway at 2 o'clock in the morning, and that thing would go M-O-N-Y. I used to say, why doesn't somebody get that thing fixed? This is beginning to bug me. M-O-N-Y. M-O-N-Y, it would just flash, and then it would go M-O-N-Y, 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 and underneath it, it would say 314, 315, M-O-N-Y, and then there would be a little yellow pole or something, go... And it would be a green star at the top. M O N Y. And I'm walking along Broadway trying to figure out why aren't they getting that thing fixed? Everybody is seeing it all over town, this misspelling. This is awful. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, so, so either you look at it or you don't. You know, I find that most people don't, and those who don't always figure that those who do are a little bit out of their minds. What's this young man speaking about? Well, I'm walking along 16th Street the other day. Madam, how do you feel this one? I'm walking along 16th Street on the west side, and I, and I notice in through one of the doorways, you know, that there's the little ante room or the lobby into one of these office buildings where there's the automatic elevator that goes up and down and there's this big directory hanging in there with all the little white letters and it tells where everything is. And then there's usually two or three big signs that say barber shop to the right or coffee shop to the left or there's a, uh, an arrow that points and says telephones that way. Has it ever occurred to you that one of the major industries of New York is telephoning? Honestly, it really is. One of the major industries here in New York City is just plain telephoning. I don't mean getting anything done about it. I mean just telephoning. <laughs> There's always a line of people standing in front of a telephone booth telephoning. If you could somehow get, get, get a corner on that market, if you could collect one cent on every one of these... these <laughs> don't worry, somebody is. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. I, I can't help it, you know. <laughs> don't feel sorry for the phone company. <laughs> They have little itsy-bitsy pink phones now that light up in the dark. <laughs> I can see Wallace Berry. <laughs> He's rushing. He rushes into the. He rushes into this room to make a phone call. Some disaster has happened, and he grabs a hold of this little itsy-bitsy, uh, this little 
John Quill yellow phone, the one that lights up in the dark. He's trying to dial it, and his finger can't fit into the. <laughs> come on, man, man! Oh, come on, man! What's the matter with this phone? And his finger is caught in the dial. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. So I'm walking along 16th Street, and I look in there, and there's a big sign that says coffee shop, and there's another big sign that says barber shop that way. And then above it, there's a sign that says the Margaret Sanger Bureau. And there's a great big blue and white sign, and all it says is fertility, one flight up. Well, I saw that one, and I walked on a little ways, and then this is beginning to soak down into my consciousness. <laughs> You begin to understand the nature of our fears. Uh, who would like to shoot an arrow into the air with me? I mean, you know, not worry much about where it lands. You know, just up it goes. M O N Y. M O N Y. M O N Y. Three one six. Well, I suspect, though, however, that these are the little secrets. Speaking of secrets, we have with us today the Village Voice. We've been keeping it neatly secret here for the past 16 minutes. And we have with us the Village Voice today. And in case any of you are interested, uh, on the current issue of the Village Voice, the front page, I have a small sketch which I did of the new Village Voice office. I would like to... Uh, point out that if you are visiting the village over the weekend, you know, this is the day that the big uh, art show gets underway down there, officially, that is. And right in the heart of Sheridan Square now, directly across the street, as a matter of fact, it's uh, dry, directly angling across the street, is the paper book gallery. But the Village Voice has a new office. And more than that, uh, I'm, I'm, of course, you know my involvement with the Village Voice. Did I ever tell you how this first started? Uh, uh, this is this is something that might be of some interest to you, but it's a strange thing how how a long involved uh, period of your life will begin. Usually, it begins quietly on cat's feet. Uh, often, you're not even aware of it. And I'll tell you, I was not aware of this when it happened. I used to do the all night radio show here at W O R, as you know. Funny thing, how I got involved in that too. Uh, that that's another story which will wait for other days of revelations to come. Revelations, of course, in capital letters, ancient carved stone letters. But uh, I was doing this late night radio show and I was hot. Boy, we used to do it out at Carteret, New Jersey. And I don't know whether you've ever worked out there, Jim, but uh, in August or in July, when the Carteret, New Jersey transmitter house has really worked itself up to a lather about two o'clock in the morning when the the heat is laying over the Jersey bogs out there. It is just unbelievably hot in that building with that 50-kilowatt transmitter going and no ventilation at all. And I used to sit out there wearing nothing but a pair of shorts and work all night, just slave all night, trying to dredge things out of my mind, <laughs> trying to see what was right down there in that dark little... Have you ever read Freud's definition of the id? You know about this little thing? This beautiful definition. I remember when I first ran into it. Uh, I would suggest if you if you're looking up uh, things today, I would suggest you look up Freud's uh, original definition of id, and you will find that there are many poetic overtones to this thing, and it describes that little gray furry creature that's within each one of us, Jim. That little gray dark creature, which none of us really know anything about which has no connection with logic, which has no connection with mores, morals, which has no connection with the learned way of life, but which nevertheless lurks underneath that surface of each one of us, even you, madam. I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no little gray furry creature living with inside of me, Mr. Shepherd. Oh, no. Well... I'm out there working late, two, three o'clock in the morning, and I'm dealing with this little gray furry creature, the id, the ego, the super ego, and all the rest of the layers, you know, and I'm digging and digging and digging. And out of the darkness, one late night, oh boy, well, it must have been four o'clock in the morning, I got a telephone call from this guy. And all he said was, uh, I'm Ed Fancher, and I have this little unsuccessful newspaper, and uh, I sure would like to have a piece from you once. 
I'd just like to say hello. Because I figure you're fighting the same fight. I don't know what it is either, but it's the fight. And so a couple of days later, we had, uh, we had a, we had a cucumber sandwich somewhere. And that was the beginning of all of it. And right now, the Village Voice is one of the most important new journals in America. It really does truly have an international readership and also an international reputation. Is very seriously read in many of the universities throughout Europe as a, as an example of a side of America that very few Europeans even know exists. You know, the idea that Europeans have about us is often just people who are concerned with next year's car, who are concerned with last week's big, gigantic movie, who are concerned with what Marilyn Monroe is saying to Yves Montan this week, uh, these are the things which most Europeans think we are deeply concerned with. And I would say, uh, in all fairness, that in large part they're right. But the village voice represents a divergent view. And I'm not speaking of a politically divergent view. I'm speaking of a divergent view of the nature of America. And if you'd be interested, I think you'd... Uh, I can't imagine anyone reading the village voice for more than a month without being uh, either very angry at it or very amused by it, and or a combination of all the mingled emotions you feel when you're involved with something that people have done. It's a, it's a most complete newspaper. Uh, it, of course, uh, this is the paper that discovered and made famous uh, Jules Pfeiffer. Uh, Nat Hentoff has done some of the absolutely best stuff he's ever done in the pages of the Village Voice. All sorts of people have written for it. And on the current issue, I have done a drawing. In case you're interested, you will find it there on the front page. Uh, like everybody else who draws, I say, oh, it's not one of my best. Actually, it's one of my rottenest. But uh, you'll find it there. And it's just this kind of paper. And, and nobody, this might come to some as some surprise to you, nobody who writes for the Village Voice gets a cent for what they do. Everybody does it purely because this is a journal where they know they can do it. And they know that it's welcomed. And if you would like to find out about the Village Voice... If you would like to subscribe to it, it's three dollars for one year, and it's a weekly, of course. They are taking they are taking calls right now. The phone number is Watkins four four six six nine. And incidentally, one little word: if you have been planning to subscribe and have been putting it off, uh, there is uh, there have been words said around the voice that very shortly, due to tremendously rising costs, they might perhaps very in the very near future be forced to raise the cost of their subscriptions. So maybe you better, and this is not, this is not advertising uh, jazz or gimmick. I'm just merely telling you a fact. Uh, so if you'd like to take advantage of the current subscription price for one solid year, you will be ultimately irritated, you will be amused, you will be fascinated. This is the Village Voice. No, no, please, out. Watkins 4, 4669 is the phone number. WA4 Four six six nine. Give them a call right now at the village. And oh, incidentally, if you're living out of town, uh, reverse the charges. It's okay. This, in fact, they want you to reverse the charges, so it's all right. Uh, no matter where you're calling from. W A four four six six nine. And oh, incidentally, if you are going off to college, I would suggest that you call them now. Make arrangements to have the voice mailed to whatever school you're going to. They would be glad to do it. W A four four six six nine is the number, and they're on duty to take calls right now. And incidentally, you don't have to, you know, just give them a call, give them your name, and they'll start sending the paper to you and bill you for it. W A four four six six nine. And while we're on the subject of the village, uh, one more note before we get too far afield from that. Uh, this afternoon at five o'clock. Now listen very carefully. The paper book gallery is opening its newest paper book gallery store. Uh, it is right near the Howard Johnson's on 6th Avenue. You know where the Howard Johnson's is down there on Lower 6th Avenue, right at 8th Street? Well, it is about a door and a half to the left of that Howard Johnson's, right down there on 8th Street, right catty corner across from the Needix there, right on the, the west side of 6th Avenue. Now, listen carefully. I'm sitting down there a couple of nights ago with Marty, and all the guys are hammering stuff up, and they're putting up the shelves and so on. I said, Marty, I want to, may I make a request? And he said, what, what? I said, may I 
make the first purchase? How many times have you walked into a little two-bit diner somewhere, and above the cash register there is this little black frame, and in the black frame is a dollar bill, Jim? Has it ever, has it ever, has it just briefly, has it ever gone through your mind that you would have liked to have been there to watch the guy make the first purchase or have to have made the first purchase? Has it ever really gone through your mind? Well, I, I, I just couldn't help but say, look, Marty, unless you have lined somebody else up to make the ceremonial first purchase, can I do it? And he says, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> like that, you know, sort of, yeah. And so I said, well, when are you opening? He says, well, we're going to open Saturday because the art show opens Saturday, and we want to have it all, you know, all at once. We're going to open Saturday night. So I says, what time? He said, 5 o'clock. I said, well, will you promise not to sell anything to anybody nor allow anybody in the shop until 5 o'clock? And he says, yeah. And so we got calling back and forth, and now here is the straight dope. I am going down to the paper book gallery, the new one, this is the brand new one on 6th Avenue, which is being opened today. I'm going to be down there at 5 o'clock, and I will enter the store all by myself. <laughs> I will look over all the assembled goods. I will judiciously select what I wish to select and put down my dollar bill and make the first purchase at the paper book gallery in their new store on 6th Avenue. And I think this is going to be a store that's going to be around for 100 years. It's a beautiful store. And, and I, I think it's a tremendous... It's, it's one of those things... I've always wanted to be the first guy across the new George Washington Bridge. Never will be, you know. I've always wanted... Can you imagine who was the first guy who made it across the Triborough Bridge and who paid the first fare? This unsung hero someplace. And you know that, that there is a whole group of people who travel to openings all over the country and who compete with one another to be the first to travel through the, the open ribbon, you know, when the ribbon is cut. Arr! He drives out in his car and drives like mad. The first guy who drove down the, the new New Jersey turnpike. You know that there is a club of people who do this? And they compete one against the other and they're very well known to each other? You know that there's a, new, there's a guy who hasn't missed a bridge opening in America for over 30 years and who has been first across over 20 bridges in America? This is a true unsung hero. He has never been on the Ed Sullivan Show. <laughs> his fame is his own, but by George, he's there. You know, he knows. And, and I'm going to be the first to buy something. Wouldn't it be fantastic? You know what I, I'd love to do? I'd love to walk into the paper, the new paper book gallery, see, and walk all up and down, and all the people are waiting for me to make my first purchase. And then I, uh, they're, they're looking in, see, and Shepard is walking around, and, and the word is getting back. He's in the Kierkegaard section now. Oh, he's, he's looking at Camus now. He, he's over in the dramatic section. Oh, what's he done? He's, he's, he's talking to the clerk now. It looks like he's getting mad. Something's wrong, Fred. He's getting mad. Shepard's coming back out. He's, he's, he's coming back out. He, he's walking through the crowd. He's on his way to the A Street bookstore. Shepard is not buying anything for the opening purchase at the paper book. He's mad. He's... <laughs> well, anyway, today at 5, now listen very carefully. At 5 o'clock, I am going to be at the paper book bookstore, the gallery down there, and I think it should be a gas. I'm going to make my first purchase, the first purchase ever made in this new store. And, listen carefully, Marty Geisler was able to, somehow, I have nowhere, no knowledge of where he did it. Now, now don't, don't ruin it. This is W-O-R-A-M with FM New York, okay? So, Marty has been able to gather someplace 300 copies of I, Libertine. These have been off the press, have been off the market since 1956. These are true collector's items. This is the last of the great printing of I, Libertine. And, and uh, no jazz, this is a true collector's item. And I think in 20 years, this will be one of the great literary curios of our time. He is going to give away to the first 300 people who show up one copy of I, Libertine. And I will be on hand, in case you're interested, to throw it in your face with, with the accompanying Excelsior involved. And if you're, in, if you're really interested in this, 
If you really want to know what all that was about, I think for about 10 minutes or so at around 5.30, I will be on hand to discuss it to anybody who wants to know about it, what really happened in that whole, that whole strange uh, thing that developed here in America in 1956. Uh, that will be at the paper book gallery. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there are none of these things around. And where Marty got them, I do not know. He said, I have been able to get 300 copies, and these are the last of them. He bought them from some warehouse someplace. And these are real collector's items, and he will give them away to the first 300 people who come in and merely say Excelsior. He's just not going to hand them out with every purchase, you know. You just got, you got to identify yourself. You got to say Excelsior, and you got to have the look in the eye, Dad, or you're not going to get away with it. This is the paper book gallery today at five. Now, this paper book gallery, don't go down to the one on Seventh Avenue. Don't go down to the one on Third Street. It is on Sixth Avenue. Just take the subway right down to the Fourth Street exit. You know where the Fourth Street exit is? On the Seventh Avenue line? Or is it the Sixth Avenue line? What is it? IRT. That's it. Just get off. Get off at the 4th Street or the NYU exit. Just get off. Uh, they sometimes call it the 8th Street exit, but it's the 4th Street exit. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's about nine different signs down there, but it's most generally called the 4th Street exit. Just get off, and you'll pop out above ground. You'll be at 6th Avenue and 8th Street. And there, right next to the Howard Johnson, will be the paper book gallery. And I will be there with my hot buck in my hand. <laughs> you're ready to make the first purchase. You know, this, this, uh, I don't believe that historians generally record the kind of history that really is the history of a people. Uh, I think little things like this thing that's happening tonight at the paper book gallery, these are the things that most of us are really involved in, these, these strange little surrealistic situations. And I have a feeling that something surrealistic is liable to happen tonight at the paper book gallery. Oh, yes, they're going to have a ribbon, a specially selected ribbon across the door. The ribbon will be very carefully cut by a very carefully selected listener. And all of us will charge in and, you know, the first guy will steal the first book. The first, <laughs> the first fist fight will break out. And, and the whole mess, you know, the whole mess will start and will go on endlessly then from hour after hour after hour. The whole business of business. Can, can you imagine the first... I'll tell you, one of my friends... You know, there's so many unrecorded things. One of my friends at the University of Pennsylvania, who's a famous anthropologist, got back from, from the great Amazon basin. And uh, he had made a, a discovery and is now writing a paper on it. And he says it's one of the most important discoveries yet involving the very dimmest, the very beginnings, the very, very th th the itsy-bitsy seedlings of mankind, the beginnings of all of this mess. I mean, the whole thing. It led to everything. All of it. There are these two guys sitting on the shores of this antediluvian lake. It's la it later became known as Lake Titicaca. Lake Titicaca. You know that, <laughs> you know that I'm walking, just parenthetically I have to put this in, I'm walking along on the east side up around 78th, something like that, 75th or something, way over on the east side, 2nd Avenue, I believe it was, at 3.30 in the morning, three days ago, and all the stores along there are black, they're closed. All kinds of little antique shops and places where they sell uh, appliances and one thing and another. And right in the middle of, a, of the block is a store that is not only wide open, the lights are lit in there, the doors are open, and people are going in and out. At 3.30 in the morning, what kind of a store do you think it was? Well, I'll tell you. It was unbelievable, and I'm telling you the truth. This is what it was. The, the lights were all lit, and I saw that store. I was walking downtown. You know, I was, I was coming from the uptown side, and I see this store. I thought, well, is this an all-night bakery or an all-night restaurant, or what is it, you know? And I just kept seeing it. And I, I, I sidled over across the street to be on the side, and I saw the people going in and out. People were really going in and out at 3.30 in the morning. And there was a bright light bulb hanging there in the window. And I get to this store, and what do you think it is? There's a great big sign printed in this awful red print with yellow outlines with a strange-looking zodiac uh, superimposed with stars and moons 
and all sorts of black hands and everything all over the window. And it says, Madam Titi Kaka, hand reader, palmist, advisor. Madam Titi Kaka, hand reader, palmist, advisor. <laughs> she was doing an all night, 24 hour a day rushing business. I'm telling you the truth. And, and you could see these people going in and out of there. What were they being advised on at 3.30 in the morning? Well, of course, I'll tell you this. At 3.30 in the morning, this is the time when we all need advice. This is, the, this is the dark night of the soul. When you lie in your bed and you look up at that dark ceiling, and once in a while, a little beam of light will cross it as a car makes the big bend around the big tree. And you lie there. You say, I wish, I wonder, oh, the master plan. Like, like Titicaca never knew such a world. Well, Madam Titi Kaka knows exactly what she's about. Palmist, reader, advisor. You imagine yourself sitting in there when all of a sudden she gets a call from the State Department? <laughs> I'm just, you know, I can't help it. And so these two guys are sitting by the shores of Lake Titi Kaka. One guy was named Charlie, as far as my friend can ascertain. It was the early version of Charlie. The, the, the way it was really pronounced is unpronounceable to the modern, uh, the modern tongue. His friend was Og, for the purposes of identification. The two of them sat there, and they contemplated their navel, and had been contemplating their navel now for four eons. Uh, figuratively speaking, of course. When one would topple over sideways and disintegrate into a pile of bleached bones, he would be replaced by another Og, or Charlie. And both of them sat looking out over the gray waters of this ancient antediluvian primeval lake. Everything was gray. The trees hadn't even been invented yet. And the two of them are just sitting there on their duff, sort of crouched over, hunched, looking. Once in a while, a little gray vapor fog would rise out of the center of the lake. And occasionally, Charlie, who was the taller of the two, would go down to the shores of the lake itself, pick up a few clams and come back, knock them together, and the two of them would sit and enjoy some little necks. Very ancient little necks, and both in and out of season, they were that type. And they both sat there and looked. Until one day it happened. No one knows quite how or why it happened, but it did. Charlie goes down to the shore of the lake, picks up three or four clams, comes back, kneels down with a cracking of his ancient knees, and begins to devour a little neck. Og sat there respectfully waiting for his share. Just waiting. Nothing happened. Charlie devoured another little neck clam. And finally, Og, unable to contain himself any longer, nudged Charlie in the lower floating rib with his elbow. <coughs> Charlie said nothing but very carefully, very deliberately, and very... Uh, intriguingly, shall we say, open his third little neck directly under the nose of Og. <coughs> and there it lay, that succulent morsel of primeval flesh, ready to be devoured, ready to be enjoyed. Charlie said nothing, but quietly <coughs> he sipped the juice from the succulent third clam and just sat and waited. Finally, Og can contain himself no longer. He reached out for the clam. Charlie moved it out of his grasp by a fraction of an inch. Just moved it back a little bit. <laughs> it was the first advertising scheme. Og reached further. And then Charlie, without so much as batting an eyelash, to this day he doesn't know why he did it, motioned in the general direction of Og's stone knife, which Charlie had admired for, lo, these many seasons, being of a particularly interesting grade, variety, and color of flint. And it slowly began to dawn on Og. He moved backwards a little, down on his haunches, you see, it was well known that between the two, Charlie was the much better clam digger than the other. He was, he was talented. Hogg leans back on his haunches and contemplates the infinite for a split second, 
And without thinking twice, he made that first fatal move. Talk about the apple. <laughs> he reached down, pulled out his flint knife, immediately handed it over to Charlie and made a grab for that succulent morsel of quivering little neck flesh. <laughs> and that's how it all started. Charlie tucked Og's knife in his belt next to his stone knife and went down to the shore and began to lay in a larger stock of clams. He was waiting for the crowd to arrive. And that's how it all began. Isn't that a fantastic discovery? Wait till this one hits the pages of National Geographic. Wait till life does an editorial on our ancient primeval friends about that one. Do you know what this led to? It's led to the paper book gallery yeah, reopening at 5 o'clock tonight, me going down there to make the first purchase. It's led to the Ed Sullivan Show. It's led to politics, fistfights, and gunfire of all nature, of all qualities. The unrecorded history. Speaking of unrecorded history, what are they going to say about us a thousand years from now? I mean, really, what are they going to think of us? What are they honestly going to think of you and us together, aggregate, in this vast circus of life? Oh, 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 the American dream. Oh, the American mission. Oh, the dire, the dire, dire, dark broodings and the thoughts that lurk deep in the soul of man. I can remember sitting outside that radio when I was a kid. I'm forever... Blowing bubbles. I am forever dreaming dreams. I'm forever chasing rainbows. I am forever chasing rainbows. Only an American could have written that song. And I'm sitting out there listening to my radio when I'm a kid. Crouched next to the Crosley Peter Pan model. Believe it or not, our Crosley radio of that period had inscribed in thin, etched gold leaf lines the figure of Peter Pan. And Peter Pan is blowing his flutes and his pipes. And out of my radio comes this phrase. Am I the, am I the only one that heard this? Please, one person, tell me. Tell me. Can anyone else hear it? Who said this? Come on, wake up in there. One of you, Ed, somebody. Who said that? You didn't hear it, did you? Uh Uh-huh. None of you know what I might have said. And I'm not going to be the one to tell you. I did just exactly what you're writing on your log that I didn't do. (laughs) Now, come on. Did anybody else out there hear that? Who knows? the evil that lurks in the hearts of men. And I am nine years old sitting out there. I am right in the heart of my Bobsy twin stage. I have just graduated from Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy, and I am just beginning my Wizard of Oz period. I had not yet encountered a true humbug. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> American dream. Cast the law for the bath there. Oh. Please set that back, Jim. Set that back. I've got to, I've got to do it again. Set it back. Just give me about 30. See, there's nobody. Nobody remembers that. Who knows what evil. Listen. Who knows what, what, what idiocy lurks in the hearts of men. Who knows what insanity lurks there just below the surface. But then again, on the other hand, who can make the statement that thus is so and so is thus? Robert, listen to this little note that I clipped out of the New York Times. Robert, 
Hilly Hill, a fellowship on Sunday afternoon, paid off a bet made during deer season with Frederick Fritz Miller of Indian Mills at the Buckshot Deer Club in Indian Hills. I'd like to point out something. I'm always a little leery of people who, between their first name and their last name, there is a name that is in quotes, Fritz, Bucky, Freddy, Harold. <laughs> Hill bet the club would get seven deer and Miller bet they wouldn't. The loser was to push the winner in a wheelbarrow from the clubhouse to tumble in a distance of over three miles. The club got six deer. Hill, the pusher, was dressed with short gunning pants, plaid shirt, and blonde wig. Miller wore gunning clothes with an aluminum foil crown matching the aluminum foil covered wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow had an aluminum foil covered canopy, but the wind blew it off in the field and upset the wheelbarrow so that it had to be taken off to continue the trip. They were allowed two short stops along the way for guess what? The entire three miles was pushed in a wheelbarrow by a man wearing an aluminum foil crown, pushing a man in a wheelbarrow wearing a blonde wig, because they only shot six deer this year instead of the seven that had been wagered. A truck accompanied them on the entire trip, furnishing music by Sonny Jennings and his cowboy musicians, all of them wearing six guns and ten-gallon hats. Nineteen automobiles loaded with cars and people followed to witness the event. Must have been some religious thing that had to do with a sacrifice to the great god of the forest plenty. They only got six deer instead of seven. Only in America. Only, only in the sweet dream of Kill it! <laughs> oh, hey, listen. Speaking of killing it, uh, I talked. I talked to the electronic workshop about ten minutes before we went on the air. They have exactly. Get this now. Listen carefully. They have just three, three, just three hi-fi systems left that are to be shipped out to whatever college or wherever it is that you want this thing to be shipped within the next week. This is the last week that this system will be on sale at the Hi-Fi Electronic Workshop. And I'd like to tell you briefly, in case you missed the previous program about it, I would like to tell you what this is about, that the Electronic Workshop down on 8th Street in the village about six months ago decided that what was really needed in the high fidelity field was a compact true high fidelity component system that could be bought could be purchased uh, within the price range of these ridiculous portable or these ridiculous package quote hi-fi systems or hi-fi sets that people have been paying out good money for and regretting ever since in short they put together a very special kind of a high fidelity system when I say system, I mean separate, high-quality components, which are all put together, all ready to run. All you have to do is plug in about three little plugs, and you will get with this system complete instructions on how to do it. Now, this system uh, sells within the price range. It actually sells for about half of what you'd spend for a mediocre television set. And believe me, it is a true high-quality, high-fidelity system. I'll tick off exactly what it involves. It involves a Harman Kardon, a Harman Kardon amplifier with preamplifier, and incidentally, Harman Kardon is good equipment. It, can, it includes a, an English Garrard four-speed record changer. This is an automatic record changer with a GE magnetic cartridge, uh, a GE ceramic magnetic cartridge, one of the, one of the finest, one of the finest rugged hi-fi cartridges on the market today with a diamond stylus, incidentally. It also includes a Hartsdale speaker system, and that is encased in a Hartsdale walnut-finished speaker cabinet, and all of it fits into your bookshelf. It is, it's perfect for a college dormitory, absolutely perfect. 
It also includes, well, it includes all the wiring, it includes all the equipment, it includes everything for a true hi-fi system. And incidentally, for just a few extra dollars later on, you can convert it to stereo if you wish. Now, this whole thing, uh, the way it stands, if you were to buy it in any one of the, quote, discount stores, any one of the famous discount stores, this thing would cost you around $150. They are putting it out in a package. There are just three of them left, just three of these systems left. Now, get me, this is, this, is, this is the straight story. There are just three left this afternoon. They are putting it together in a package that sells for $119. Now, that's far less than you'd even, than you pay for the so-called package units. They, don't, they wouldn't even come near the quality of this system. All high quality, and it's guaranteed unconditionally for one full year, not by the manufacturer, but by the electronic workshop. Now, if you would like to... And, oh, by the way, they will send this this system to wherever you want it to be sent. If, if you live in a small apartment, this is perfect because it fits right into a bookshelf. You can stick it any place that you'd like to get it out of the way, and it will work perfectly in a bookshelf. It will work perfectly for a college dormitory. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's spectacularly fitted for that. And if you are going off to school and you would like to take a really good hi-fi system that will really give you years and years and years of excellent service, you better get in touch with them right now. And their number is Gramercy 30140. Their address is 26 West 8th Street in the village. And they will be open till about 9 o'clock tonight. Excuse me, 8 o'clock. They told me uh, it's only 8 o'clock tonight. It's 26 West 8th Street, and I would suggest that if you want to want to have one of these things set off and set aside for yourself, you better do it and, and call them up quickly to have them set it aside and come in and look at it. There is no obligation, of course. If you, if you don't like it when you see it, fine. But I suggest you give them a call. It's Gramercy 30140. And believe me, after this show, this system will never again be mentioned on this program. This is not... Uh, this is not one of those tricky things. They put it together. They put about 35 of them together three weeks ago, and that is the end of it. Uh, they, they make about yay much money on it, just a little tiny sliver, enough to just pay for the postage. And they will send it to wherever you are going, postage-free and guaranteed to work. It's Gramercy 30140, 26 West A Street, the electronic workshop. And incidentally, while we're on the subject of the village... Right down the street from the workshop and up around the corner, over on 3rd Street, 82 West 3rd Street, is, believe me, the finest oriental restaurant that I know of in these parts. If you're planning to make the New York scene and you're looking for a good place to eat, and incidentally, they will be open Sunday. They'll be open from noon all the way on through over the Labor Day weekend. I would suggest you mark this one down. This is Yin and Yang, which is currently getting quite a play by a lot of people. And many of them don't even dig oriental food, and they find that this is completely different than what they've been used to having. It's at Ying and Yang, 82 West 3rd Street. They're open till around, oh, I'd say 1 o'clock this morning. They're open till midnight on Sundays, and they will be open till, oh, maybe midnight on Monday. But they open at noon, and they have a bar. And please wear a jacket. This is 82 West 3rd Street, Ying and Yang. Here's the name of the organization there. And speaking of organizations, you know, it's, it's a funny business about organizations. Uh, we're both afraid of them, and we want to be part of them. I don't know which, which it is we want to do. We both want to be in the circus, and we want to watch the circus. We both want to decry. It's, it's, have you ever had the feeling that the whole town is covered with thousands of IBM machines, all of which are in touch with one another late at night by telephone? by automatic telephone, and they are exchanging data about guess what? <laughs> there was this little picture in the Times that showed one IBM machine talking to another over a telephone line, and I wondered what they were talking about. Other IBM machines? Oh, no. If you want to fly the coop, do it via Lufthansa Airlines. I mean, it, there might not be much time left. Contact your travel agent. Tell them to hold a ticket in abeyance ready that any minute now you're liable to have to make a quick getaway uh, to central wherever it is you want to go. I mean, way far from the coastline someplace. 
and sit and collect small glass bells that were made by small Swiss glass bell makers. This is Lufthansa, the friendly German airlines, where they really turn out a ham sandwich. Be the first in your block to make the total break. This is WOR Radio, your station for news. Help your children start the school year right. Get them the world's only fully illustrated color encyclopedia. Twelve volumes altogether now available at your Flying A service station at the sensational low, low price. Just 49 cents for volume one and 99 cents each for the rest of the set. The Harwin Picture Encyclopedia. Extra easy to read and packed with pictures of important people, places, and things. Even modern rockets and missiles. And right now, your Flying A dealer is making a special introductory offer. Volume one at the bargain price of only 49 cents when you stop it.